Well, this is Richard C. Wilson of the Family Office Club, and today we're doing a member spotlight interview with Richard Hambury. Welcome, Richard. Hello. So, Richard, you run a company called Santa Health. Can you give us kind of a, a one-liner on, on what you guys are up to? Yeah, chronic pain reimagined, using a device to actually control chronic pain rather than resorting to drugs. Okay. And how are you doing it without using drugs? What's that technology look like? Uh, this is this is what it currently looks like. This is the current version. Um, hmm. We're using neuromodulation um, that is audio visual. So we're using pulsed light and sound to change patterns within the within the brain, which then lowers um, lowers levels of pain. So it almost looks like a Oculus virtual reality headset, but it's programmed to you know have the certain uh, patterns that have been, I guess, proven to help with pain relief and, you know, sensory so that it uh, helps helps you soothe and deal with, with pain relief, et cetera, without, you know, using the drugs essentially. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, originally um, I had a road traffic accident in the Yemen. I was forced okay. to drive a jeep off a bridge uh, in order to avoid a head-on collision with a petrol truck. Um, that gave me spinal injuries, uh, a belly button level T8, T10. Hmm. Um, and, uh, um, when I was back in the UK, they put me through the standard of care for neuropathic pain, okay. which hasn't changed in 28 years. Wow. Um, it's opioids, gabapentin, other drugs, internal stimulators, external stimulators. Mm. And then especially when everything else fails, uh, they give you meditation and that's really done as suicide prevention. Uh, they're not expecting it to actually work at that point. Um, mm. And back then they uh, used to give uh, that, that, that meditation, which now would be called MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, to sure. really take the edge off. Um, and I was looking, for, for me, that didn't make any sense. I was like, okay, my, my pain levels are at 20. I've got an electric storm happening in my brain, and you're expecting me to sort of hold a candle against that storm with, with my total inability to meditate. Right. And then I thought, right. well, if I'd already meditated for 20 years, um, then actually that skill would be useful right now because then I could control how much um, I was experiencing pain. And so I then did research into the long-term uh, changes that happen in brains of long-term meditators. Hmm. And I used that as my roadmap of um, basically how do I create that from, from where I am now in, in that level of chronic pain. Hmm. Um, and it turned out that audio-visual is the, really the only way of doing that um and the I reason see. why is because um can i can i share a screen with you and share a picture sure. yeah um, Go ahead. if you can enable screen sharing uh yes let me do that here screen share advanced sharing there we go brilliant great um so can you see my screen now? Yes. So basically the, the picture on the left um, is showing the brain of someone in severe pain. Okay. And it's showing the left-hand side of the, the activity in the left-hand side of the brain versus the activity in the right-hand side of the brain. So this is the left-hand side of the brain and the right-hand side. And this very big disparity between left and right-hand side of the brain was what mine was showing at the same, at the time. Um, on a device that was used in the research on long-term meditators. And the picture on the, on the right, where you've got that balance of left and right hemisphere, was what all of the brains of long-term meditators looked like. Hmm. So I was like, okay, how do I change my brain from the first one to the second one? Um, hmm. it turns out by pulsing light and sound in particular ways, you can trigger the brain to go back to that sort of optimal state and hmm. um, with me that wiped out all of my underlying nerve damage pain uh, in over a three-month period so yeah. I haven't had any nerve damage pain since since 1993 hmm. and, and, and what I didn't know at the time was that that disparity shows up with anybody with uh, long-term severe chronic pain and long-term anxiety okay. um, or traumatic okay. Um, right. There's a, you know, my friend, uh, Joe Paula, she says that 
addiction is really just the body trying to soothe pain. Like any type of addiction, you're just trying to soothe yourself. And between the problems with vets and opioids and other drug abuse or other bad behavior that's trying to soothe pain, obviously there's a huge demand for stuff of this nature because, you know, I've bought the Muse headset that has a little chirping bird type thing to help you meditate. It makes me uh, curious when you're doing the research on this, how much of the device is um, the lights and sensory actively helping with pain going down and how much of it is a distraction thing to keep the ADD world in this meditative state because they would just be horrible at meditating otherwise. So the fact that something is happening focuses their brain on that little something and the byproduct is them being soothed or, or those things are connected. So you, you, it's hard to know maybe. Yeah. So, so basically with, um, with almost, uh, every VR system currently, they are purely doing a distraction. Uh, okay. There are one or two VR companies that are generally doing, genuinely doing smart VR. Um, sure. Karuna is a good example, um, okay. where they're improving things after you stop using the device. But generally speaking within VR, that's the problem. You're only distracting. Um, what we're doing is actually creating um, frequency patterns that then the brain starts repairing its own damage. So chronic, chronic, chronic uh, pain is essentially neuroplasticity that's worked against you. It's your brain right. has got used to, it got more efficient at doing pa- uh, patterns that are maladaptive. maladaptive. And the yes. key thing why the, the, the drugs don't work um, is, this, is this chart here. So within, within chronic pain, you have issues of anxiety, depression, and sleep issues, as well as your acute pain. And all of them are what called compounding comorbidities. So they all contribute to making each other one worse. And if you take a drug to fix one area that has side effects in another area, you're increasing that comorbidity, that that compounding comorbidity in another area. Fibromyalgia is a very good example of this, which is why it's our first to market. The average fibromyalgia patient ends up taking a cocktail of between five and eight drugs, um, wow. and they all have problems. Um, so mm-hmm. let me just cycle that into that one. Um, yeah, this one here. So mm-hmm. they will take a drug to deal with each of the compounding comorbidities. And none of these drugs have ever been tested for safety and efficacy in combination with any of the others, let alone the entire cocktail that someone usually ends up having. Mm. So none of those approaches works particularly well. So within that, within that cocktail, um, Lyrica is the best-selling drug for fibromyalgia. Um, right. it's, it's, it has a 15% improvement in quality of life. And um, Everyone who, who has fibromyalgia is, is usually tried on it um, because it is the only drug that has even that level of efficacy. Of everyone that tries it, only 20% continue to take it because of how bad the side effects are. Mm-hmm. And in our first clinical trial, um, we got 45% improvement in quality of life with zero negative side effects. Wow. Um, and pe- plenty of positive ones. And we, we're now past the nine month follow up point. Um, and basically 90% of people who started the trial were still using the device every day at, at, at nine months and maintaining wow. all, of those, all of those results. And that is the kind of result you can get by, by helping the brain address all of the compounding comorbidities rather than going after each one with a drug that and then adds to an overall problem. Right, right. That's interesting. Uh, You know, 20 years ago, I worked in a call center at the university I was at and would just, you know, basically be cold calling 200 alumni a night asking for donations. But I remember talking to this one lady for about 30 minutes. And um, I was happy that anyone wanted to talk to me at all that she had been through the Holocaust in a prison camp. When she got released and came to America, they said, part of the deal is now you get unlimited education. And so she got her master's in nutrition, but also master's in 
uh, pharmacology and other advanced degrees on nutrition and interaction between chemicals. And she said, there's almost nobody who takes, who gets all these different degrees in the same brain and no one realizes all the interconnection and the chemical reactions between all the things they're taking. And it's yeah. very scary because it's like they test one drug in a silo, but people are on nine different drugs, seven different drugs or on a, you know, Heart, heart disease, this plus this other nutritional supplement plus something else prescribed for pain. So uh, I remember her saying how scary that is and how it's just people just aren't aware, and just like your last slide was was talking about. And um, maybe you're going to get to this, but on the cost side of things, I would imagine that a device has to compete pretty well against taking five different drugs uh, in terms of insurance companies getting on board at some point. You know, I know with new devices, they never are, but at some point you would think it's in their own interest to try this out, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and, and so currently um, we've got one much larger trial that is starting this week uh, at Duke University on 150 fibromyalgia patients to basically okay. replicate the results we had in this smaller study. Um, okay. And then with the results of that, we've already had two um, of the uh, two insurers um, say they want to talk to us as soon as those results are, are out um, and go for reimbursement. Now in the, yeah, congrats. Yeah, and in the meantime, we are able um, to sell direct to the consumer. Um, okay. At the moment, we, are, we, we have our um, 513G confirmation so we can sell as a wellness device. Okay. Uh, so we can't specifically um, target fibromyalgia patients who can gain the most from this. Um, but once we have our FDA indication, we'll be able to sell both direct fibromyalgia patients and to go through doctors and physicians and hospitals. So it's okay. a dual strategy of reimbursement um, plus direct. Um, and with this fibromyalgia, because there really is no good alternative, um, we've had very good viral results from the first um, uh, for the first clinical trial, the first 20 people that went through the study, um, we had approximately four, four inbound inquiries for each person on the study. Uh, and that's, and that's because there is really no alternative. So, um, once, once word gets out there, I think we're going to be, um, our biggest problem is going to be controlling the volume of sales, not, uh, and, and, and matching it with supply. That's right. going to be not not the issue of how do you sell this to people, because it's going to sell. Right, us. right. Maybe more managing the supply chain and making sure you know keeping quality up while your manufacturing has to go a hundred times, you know, faster or bigger. So that makes sense. Um, that's what, what would be the number in this round. That's that's what the money in this round is for. It's basically to complete okay. the trial, uh, make sure that we can uh, redesign the device to be lower cost of goods. Um, more easy to manufacture, easier supply chain. Um, and then the third, the third goal that we're trying to reach with the current level of funding is to just prove out each of the different channels that we want to go down um, on the commercial side. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. What would be the number one due diligence question that you think an investor should be asking you, even if nobody's asked it so far since you started your company? Um, that's a really good question. And uh, I think really it is around um, what you think is going to happen in the, 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 the future of healthcare. It's because it, sure. a, lot of, a lot of med tech um, and a lot of med tech investors are either on the consumer health side or they are on the, the med tech reimbursement side. And in, in my view, um, we, we have to be in a position to be able to do both. Otherwise you're at the whim of what happens within politics and what happens to the consumerization of healthcare. And if so, as a, as a company, we, we are, we can and are doing both. And if we weren't, I'd be worried about, okay, which way is the future going to go on med tech? Is it going to go to paying more out of pocket or is it going to go towards uh, the reimbursement side? And, and, and there's no way of a company knowing that at the moment. And if you're making a bet on either of those two, um, then you know you, your investors have got a 50% chance of it, of it going wrong. Um, right. The question should be, you know, how you, uh, the question that some ask, and, and our, the investors that have ended up investing in us are the people who 
are comfortable um, with both consumer healthcare and with reimbursement. Um, right. You the ability to do both as a as a as a as a strength. Um, yeah, that that's probably the most important sort of macro thing that feeds into our our business. Okay, um, and you know, companies that have to go through stages of approval, or it's a medical device, or any earlier stage healthcare company has certain aspects and and characteristics about it. I found over time. If there's an investor listening who does invest in healthcare or they're just getting started, what would be a hundred thousand dollar piece of advice you could provide to them to help them avoid making a mistake? Obviously, you just gave some advice. Uh, avoid companies that are going to have a binary result, either going to do great or cease to exist for a year or two, uh, based on you know where they bet their time and energy as a company. So that's a pretty valuable piece of advice. Is there anything else that? you think would be good for an investor to keep in mind or to know since you're, you're living in that world, you know, 24 seven right now. Yeah. I, I, I would say it was, it was on the, the data and um, credibility piece. Um, there are an awful lot of investors who, unless you have the larger 120 uh, person, 150 person on larger studies, they won't invest. And the, that means there is an opportunity for people to uh, invest in companies like us who have got the early data and the early data is so strong that we have already hit all of our p-values. So scientifically, we've already proven the point. And now we have to go to the larger study to reprove it. But if you're looking at that, it, it's, it's, it's a great investment area to go, okay, well, what studies have they got already? And then what does that mean for their chances of getting the larger studies? Because again, otherwise the larger studies become a binary bet. You're either saying, you're, you're saying, okay, well, I'm an investment company and if their large trial works, I'm great. If it doesn't, we're not good. But um, we've organized it so that we've got the early data which proves the point and then we're reproving it. And we have multiple shots on goal on top of that. So again, it's, you know, if you can, if you can get the people who if one thing doesn't work, they've got other options already um, being worked on. Um, so that you, you, you mitigate your risk within the company because otherwise right. you're left with a portfolio approach, you're left with, okay, I have to invest in 10 companies and then maybe one of them works. Well, right. within that mix, you can have a company that goes, okay, well, we've got 10 options ourselves and we only need to make one of these work. You're in a better you're in a better shape overall, right? Right, yeah, no, for sure. Um, so I was at your website earlier this morning, uh, at the start of the day. I know uh, the Santa Health website is s a n a. dot i o. Um, where else should people go besides your website to learn more about you, connect with you? Maybe they have uh, distribution, insurance company connections. I know there's members that are angels that invest in healthcare. We also have members that run healthcare related angel clubs, et cetera. So there could be all different types of interactions within the family office club. And, you know, we're getting to know each other today. I know you've spoken with Ellie on our team. Um, for all these interviews like this, it's not that we've done 400 hours of due diligence. It's just kind of making people aware of a, a member in the family office club doing something that, um, you know, it looks to be exciting. And we want to share that, share that with others. So um, people should know that, but you know, where can they learn more to get in touch with you if they see a couple of ways to, to work together, perhaps? Yeah, so the, the easiest way is um, my, my email, which is just richard at sana.io. Okay. Uh, that's, that's the easiest way. And, and right now, because we are getting towards the close of this round of financing, um, anything investment priority is, is any, any, anything about investment is taking priority. Sure. Um, and then, so the sort of, I am definitely interested in all of the um, business development type um, inquiries, um, but just bear with me on those. If you send one, I will deal with it uh, and it will get done. But it, it's the, the first priority at the moment is closing the current round of financing because we are, we are nearly across the, we're nearly across the line on that. And that's, that's where we're Great. looking to get help. Yeah. Congratulations. It's exciting. Well, I'll be interested in, um, you know, seeing how this goes, we have a um, somebody in the kind of addiction space that um, we're working with a little bit. So down the road after this round is closed, I'd like to see if there is something strategic there. Um, and definitely keep in touch as you get more of your trials done and the product rolled out. I think it's something that 
seems like it could help millions of people around the world who are kind of suffering with you know, side effects of putting a whole bunch of chemicals in their body. And perhaps some of them need those chemicals, but perhaps some would be much better off using something like what you have here. So appreciate you sharing those ideas here today. And um, anything, else, anything else you want to add before you sign off? Uh, just, to, just to share the device again. So just sure. the, way it, the way it works is you're literally just putting on, pressing a button um, under here, um, and then going into a much deeper state of relaxation um, in, in less than 10 minutes. And most people are going to sleep by, by 15 minutes. So really that sort of whole deep relaxation effect is how we're having all of the impact on all of the areas, other areas that we're working on. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a, uh, the simplicity of what we're doing allows us to go into all of the other different areas and, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I want this to be the, um, our, our aim is to be the first, uh, intervention that people try before they go on to drugs. So post-operatively, for example, you know, if you can use a device and then use half the amount of APIs you would have used before, um, that cuts your addiction rate, rate by more than about 90%. It's not a wow. linear, it's an, it's a, an exponential curve. Um, and, and the same with the same with sort of anxiety and depression drugs. We've got um, anxiety and depression study, studies um, starting shortly. Um, and yeah, so all of those other areas, anywhere where getting your body very deeply relaxed very quickly, um, that's, th those are areas we, we, we want to help it. And all we need now is the, the rocket fuel to do that. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure there's some, uh, high strung wall street types that could use that falling asleep in 15 minutes, uh, you know, uh, thing, not that I would ever be one of those people, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, I appreciate you being here. Um, if anyone has trouble getting in touch with Richard, let our team know. We'll get you directly in touch. And hope to see you again, Richard, at one of our virtual events or webinars or something. Fantastic. Take care. The real world events will start before too long again. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Stay healthy.